One thing that you may have recognized from the documentary last week is the discussion of syphilis. I don't know, I don't remember why that was even mentioned in the film. It is uh, sexually transmitted, it's bacterial, which is why things like penicillin would kill it off. So it's an infection that people get through sexual contact over time if the bacteria is not treated. The fourth stage is what we call neurosyphilis. It attacks the brain. And it starts to, when any kind of bacteria is attacking our brain, it could negatively impact how we think and behave. Syphilis and alcoholism were the two most common causes of any mental health issue way back in the day. Interesting because general paresis is a term that's associated with syphilis that started the biological school of thought when it comes to abnormal psychology. Let's talk about reasons we would not want to give someone a diagnosis. What are your concerns? Is it possible that whoever's doing the diagnosing might make a mistake? What if it's wrong? So is there stigma involved? That is absolutely a concern in our field. We want to be very careful about diagnosing people. We don't necessarily want to label people. What else do we worry about when we give someone a label? There is an appropriate diagnosis to be made. We certainly want to make the diagnosis and we can educate someone and talk about how to treat this and where to go from here. We need to be very careful about how we do that with the right words. We don't just want to be like, yep, you know what, your child, man, his ADD is so through the roof. So worry about how someone might react to that diagnosis. You do not want to send them into a spiraling depression because they just got a diagnosis. So how the psychologist or psychiatrist or social worker or counselor conveys that information is really, um, is really important. If we're going to make these diagnoses, we need to make sure that they are actual, they are legitimate, and they are handled in the right way. For some people, it brings them a sense of relief. <laughs> Insurance will cover mental health services if there is a, a billable diagnosis. All these other diagnoses that are in the DSM-5 or the ICD-10, those are billable. So absolutely, that's one of the reasons we do diagnose. We make a diagnosis so then that can trigger treatment and also then insurance should pay for that. In 1994, there was something called the Mental Health Parity Act, where they were supposed to put mental health services on the same as a medical condition, and so insurance should cover treatment for those. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to be careful with making diagnoses because there's definitely some disadvantages, but we want to make sure that when we do make diagnoses, it's for the right reasons because there's a lot at stake after that. Is it possible that there could be psychologists or psychiatrists or social workers or counselors who are terrible at their jobs and who make all the wrong diagnoses? So it's not just specific to our field. All right, the term came up before, um, validity. That has to do with usefulness. Usefulness is the information or is the diagnosis providing any kind of very useful information. If it does, we say that it's valid. Predictive validity. Predictive. Is there anything that it will tell us what's going to happen maybe in the future? So would it be important if you're a psychologist and I am the client who comes to see you and you know that I correctly meet the criteria for bipolar 1 disorder, would it be useful information for you to tell me that I have that diagnosis? Yes, it would. You can teach me something we call psychoeducation. Teach people what the disorder is, maybe a little bit of the science behind it, and what we would expect next. Okay. If a diagnosis is, has no, isn't really going to do anything for anyone, don't make the diagnosis. So validity has to do with usefulness. When we're talking about validity in terms of a test like, what it means is, is the test measuring what it's intended to measure? So I'm looking at the executive function of a three-year-old, and I'm using this test called the NEPSI. If the NEPSI doesn't actually measure executive function, should I be using it? No, it would be an invalid tool. Turns out, I looked at all the research on the NEPSI, it's a very highly valid tool. What that means is, based on all the research, the NEPSI actually measures executive function like it's supposed to measure. We can use it in our field, and insurance will pay for the cost of that. I can only use those tests if those tests have high validity. Reliability refers to consistency. If I get a certain set of information and I make a diagnosis based on this information, if I look at that information again, I should be making the exact same diagnosis. Do you see where that's consistency? All of us, say we were all really good at our job, we all should give the exact same diagnosis. We all should, based on the information, based on our fund of knowledge, we should come up with the exact same diagnosis. 
chances are that's exactly the diagnosis that the person should have, called interrater reliability. So the kappa value range is anywhere from 0 to 1.0. Um, I will tell you that in the real world, a kappa value of 0.7 or higher is considered good. There are certain disorders, and as we go through, the, when we get to the clinical chapter, there are certain disorders that have a much higher kappa value than others. Anorexia nervosa has a very good kappa value. I'm talking about making the diagnosis. That one's pretty straightforward. Okay? So the more that the psychologists agree on a diagnosis based on the information they have, the higher the kappa. The less they agree, the lower the kappa. What is your job as the rater, as a psychologist? To ask the right questions and get the right information. So if I'm the psychologist doing the diagnosing and I didn't get all the information I need, could I come up with the wrong diagnosis? That's totally on me, by the way. My job is to get as much information as possible to make that right diagnosis. But if you don't know what you're doing and you suck at what you do, <laughs> our kappa value is going to be down. It's pretty clear. And it should be pretty clear. Those doing the diagnosing. Comorbidity is the presence of more than one diagnosis that complicates things. Say someone has anorexia nervosa, but say they also have major depressive disorder. Most therapists can pick up on the anorexia part. There's visual cues, they ask the right questions, they realize yep, the person actually meets the criteria for anorexia, and then they stop asking. And they have missed that maybe they also have major depressive disorder. And that is a huge thing to miss. So when conditions are comorbid, when a person has more than one diagnosis, that can complicate this.